Hey everyone, back again. Now we're gonna get into part four that I'm doing here, which is gonna cover the second half of part two, titled, total, uh, titled Imperialism in Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism. And here we're gonna continue off for part seven, or chapter seven, Jesus. Chapter seven titled Race and Bureaucracy. So before jumping into it, if you want to follow me anywhere other than here, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy or on Twitter at David Guineo. There are links for that in the description. Um, you know who I am. If you don't know who I am, you should go really and listen to episodes one, two, and three before this one, because uh, what are you doing? Um, if you want to help me out, you can like, share, subscribe. If you're listening to this in podcast form, you can leave five stars and a review. That would help a lot. You can help me out via... Uh, help me out monetarily. I messed that up last time too. You can help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal, but obviously no pressure. There are links if you are interested in that. Uh, and uh, yeah, I don't want don't to waste any more time there. We have a lot to talk about. So let us continue on here with chapter seven titled Race and Bureaucracy. So the people became associated with races now. People didn't just exist as people, as people with, you know, political authority or power or representation. They became associated with races, which, which was just a way to uh, separate people. It was used in using conjunction with science to create divisions between people. And at the same time, governments became associated with bureaucracy. So here we had the emerging idea of people as races and of governments as bureaucracies, which were happening happened around the same time. And these two things re they really went hand in hand, and their conjunction. Their, their their combination was was instrumental to putting forward extremely oppressive governmental regimes all across the world that would often culminate into genocide or into eugenics because you would have racism that would design people as being or illustrate people as being subhuman alongside a bureaucratic machine that didn't already care about people in the first place but now a bureaucratic machine that was cold and didn't actually care about anybody, let alone people who were already viewed as being subhuman. So it was the most efficient way almost to eradicate people. It could reduce them to the subhuman status and then through the bureaucratic machine, able to wear them down, to more easily organize them and code them, which is what we saw with Nazi Germany, with uh, Jewish people being sent to the concentration camps, with the help of like IBM and with the help of other um, bureaucratic enterprises that helped with keeping uh, everything in order, the entire bureaucratic Nazi regime in order. Now, in this uh, conjunction that is between race and bureaucracy, race wasn't really all that new. Uh, racism, at least the kernels of it, definitely existed beforehand, which justified colonialism before imperialism and so on. But the bureaucracy was somewhat new. Although it too borrowed from older elements of European society, and you know we might hear the resonances of Weber's critique of the uh, mechanization or the instrumentalization—I don't even remember the term—rendering people just like cogs in the machine, and the bureaucracy steps in to do exactly that. So these concerns were there before the bureaucracy came into existence, and you know Max Weber's obviously came after the bureaucracy, but in any case. People had concerns about it. And bureaucracy was, in Arendt's words, it was the organization of a great game of expansion where every nation was seen as a stepping stone to further involvement. Every nation wasn't viewed as being a thing in itself or an identity in themselves. They were seen, seen as a means to an end, not an end in themselves, which would also explain, I think, in a lot of this, we're getting a lot. Uh, I think Arendt is very much a Kantian. She very much believes in humans being ends in themselves. That is, you can't infringe upon the rights of humans, but she leaves room for the necessity of community, the necessity for political action, political solidarity uh, in the face of all of these, these chaotic times. And so we'd see this play out in popular culture as well, or at the time in like literature where we'd have figures like Kurtz in Heart of Darkness, who is the product of superfluous capital into West Africa, which I think it's I think it's not described which nation it is exactly. It could be the Ivory Coast, where, you know, 
business interests essentially resulted in this guy going haywire and trying to just command people, uh, trying to form a nation of his own in the heart of um, heart of Africa and to just you know subordinate all black people there uh, for for his own benefit. And this is the result of both both race thinking and a bureaucratic machine that was able to organize these people in such a way as to put them under his control, under Kurtz's control so easily. And race as a distinguishing quality of people is a very convenient way to provide Europeans in this setting the belief that they understand what people are all about. So they can say, oh, we've learned X, Y, and Z about uh, black people. So therefore, we can infer everything we need from uh, from this science about black people, and it would make a, it, it easier to then command and control them. Of course, that ignores the the ways in which that there's an entire element of force behind uh, the subordination of these people. So for race thinking and for racists at the time, if black people capitulated to European aggression, they would take that as a sign that they were inferior to Europeans. Of course, completely ignoring the fact that these people are showing up with guns, uh, with armies against nothing and unprepared people that are then have no other choice than to just capitulate, than to just surrender. Now, people who were raced, and it is important to note that white people were able to kind of evade this discussion of race because, you know, white being the dominant uh, racial category, it didn't actually gain recognition in the way that Jewishness or blackness did. And so people who were raced, because race was associated in this Darwinian sense with a kind of natural, um, natural identity, these people could be associated with nature, which meant that they were like animals and of course Europeans had no problem killing uh, animals they could then apply the same logic to these people and just slaughter them without any any restraint at all and now she considers specifically the role of Dutch imperialism in South Africa with the Boers and how that contributed to these logics of imperialism so in South Africa, where the Dutch, that is the Boers, colonized, the white people enslaved the, the black residents there, the people who lived there, to such a massive extent that, they, that white people were actually assimilated somewhat uh, into that culture. They were, they were uh, essentially, you know, they enslaved so many people that they couldn't actually, uh, they, they were actually outnumbered. And there was a threat that they were going to fall, just become like uh, the black people, especially in relationship to their European friends. Their European friends would show up and be like, hey, you aren't acting the same. You know, you've spent too much time with um, the native people here. You must therefore be, uh, have regressed evolutionarily. So the Boers took it upon themselves, the Dutch people here, to really emphasize their difference from the black people in South Africa, what we know now to be South Africa, who they've enslaved, to they really wanted to uh, distinguish themselves from them. Now, all of this is incredibly ironic, too, because many of these nations were encouraged by belief in the Bible and Christianity. And, you know, if you read Christian texts, you know that uh, the idea is that all humans originated from the same point. And so we are all connected in that way. But in these acts of imperialism, White people were essentially associating themselves with, um, with gods. They viewed themselves as gods in the face of everything that was uh, going on, you know, to justify their heinous acts, which is just is blasphemous. And it's, it's, really, it's really ironic. But in any case, racism and slavery were partly influenced by a desire, uh, or they were, they were uh, I guess more I should say, they were influenced by rootlessness produced by European laziness, <laughs> which is a kind of a, not a great way to put it. But at the time, people were not interested in working. You know, uh, the capitalist economy was hard on workers. And so people didn't want to work. And what they were doing then was trying to find ways to earn quick bucks by just exploiting other people, by enslaving other people. And so racism and slavery were partly motivated by a people's lack of connection with their own 
land, their own soil, their own bodies in a sense, their own desire to work on the land, on the soil, because that work was being exploited. And so they wanted to send it somewhere else to make other people do it or to just steal from and exploit, uh, like in this case, African gold reserves, you know, just go in and take the gold and then problem solved for having to ever work again. Now, like I mentioned last time, at this time of imperialism, many Jewish people were assuming the form of financiers just because of them having historically occupied these positions. They weren't benefiting from these acts. They were just earning like a little commission off of facilitating transactions between uh, the metropole, between uh, the colonial nation and the colonized, uh, colonized nation or colonized land. So they weren't enslaving people, they weren't directly benefiting, but there was something about their lack of attachment to a nation that happened to really resonate with people who were fed up with a capitalist economy that was trying desperately to exploit them. And so it was very seductive to think, or the idea was very seductive, that Jewish people were somehow associated with this rootlessness and this desire to just earn quick money at the expense of others because they themselves didn't have roots. They themselves didn't have an attachment to a specific nation. And given just the scope of imperialism, you know, extending to so many different nations across the globe, and how Jewish people were seen as being a common denominator, denominator here, of course, capitalism wasn't the common denominator or anything else like that, or, or just white people, of course, these aren't recognized identity markers, because Jewish people were seen in these spaces doing these things, this then also contributed to that idea of a Jewish global conspiracy. Now, over time, as Africa was being cleaved apart by these, these predatory European countries and being, you know, just for its own interest, at that time, Jewish people, as assuming uh, financier roles, were gaining less, um, they, they were being less needed. And so what happened was because they had some, they still had a little bit of wealth, they actually started to open up industry all across the globe in some of these places. And obviously, you know, don't support that. Obviously, it still follows in the same vein as in the, the imperial logics that came before it and motivated it. Um, but in any case, they were doing something that everyone else was doing. But when the Jewish people began to participate in that those acts of industry or producing industries, suddenly they were being viewed as taking, you know, taking away opportunities from other Europeans, you know, white European, uh, the white European race. And so the Boer people, the Dutch uh, in South Africa, then saw the Jewish people as a sign of evil for taking away uh, their jobs and essentially bringing the, those elements of work that they tried to get away from, bringing them back right to them, which d didn't help the situation at all. Now, with the growing bureaucratic and racist principles came a desire to justify the European belief that they were superior to everybody else. And they would do this through myths and legends that would justify belief in strong individuals that would take over entire lands and colonies. And so they proffer these ideas that uh, of, of like individual in, an, an individual's capacity to rule and dominate. Now at least this was a case the case for a time, and things began to change a little bit as this logic of expansion through a bureaucratic order began to gain more and more traction because it forced people to forego national bonds and instead look towards expansion, look beyond those national barriers, and to essentially be among or be a part of the free-floating bureaucratic uh, administrations. And so what was left was not like uh, nation-state heritage that you know you could be connected to, but now more nebulous connection between people on the basis of their race. So white people were just associating themselves across nations with their whiteness, and then seeing everybody else as being possible threats to that. The most notable, as it would uh, come up uh, leading up to Nazi Germany, being the Jewish people. And this general lack of rootlessness, or this general rootlessness, encourages more violent interactions between people because it's so much easier to justify 
uh, violence against somebody else if they're getting in the way of your expansion that you see as being the only thing you're striving for. And so what we see as well is a renunciation of general laws, like human rights laws or any law like that, because they are taken as a sign out of like this global order idea that is going to get in the way of expansion. It's going to get in the way of individual rights and stand um, stand in the way of the rights of the most powerful. And they're going to be uh, used to essentially bolster up and to empower those people who shouldn't be, at least according to these white European bourgeois types who want to keep people subordinated to justify their continued exploitation. Now, an additional element to this that Arendt just kind of glosses on is that bureaucrats and bureaucratic life has a very strong affinity with secret agents. And that is because secret agents don't actually have real affiliations with states like warriors would in times past. You know, you stand in for your nation, you're going to defend your nation state uh, to the death, whereas secret agents could essentially be persuaded to work for any country if the price was right at the time. And they then really jive with the logics of bureaucrat bureaucratization that doesn't see any allegiance to any flag at all or any, any nation state at all. And that puts us here into chapter eight, continental imperialism, the pan movements. Now, also a good time for an ad. So hope that wasn't too jarring. Here we are in chapter eight, continental imperialism, the pan movements. So what were the pan movements? Well, the pan movements involved subsuming different cultures under single homogenous rule. So while Hitler and Stalin never outwardly thanked imperialism, they did appreciate the pan movements. Now the pan movements were an effort to essentially extend, in the case of like Germany, German culture to other nations and to draw affiliations between Germans and other countries and to say like, hey, come to us. Like we are, we are the motherland and we're going to expand everywhere. Now, not all nations participated in the pan movements. Only those that seemed to have bad luck or misfortune when it came to uh, traditional imperialism, like Germany, or like the Germans or the Slavs, who turned to these pan movements because they had few opportunities in other continents. And this can also be called continental imperialism, or kind of domestic imperialism within one's own continent. And it is a drive to unite common people, uh, like in the case of Germany, unite all German people. Um, and it's really like bolstered up by the idea of race, where Germans are associated with a kind of race or a pure-bloodedness that make it very um, enticing to bring them all together in all different nations. Now, unlike the other imperialism that is born out of superfluous wealth and superfluous power and superflu superfluous labor that is just trying to expand itself, continental imperialism is driven more through by ideological or political ends, binding people together and, and realizing those ends through racism by binding people together on the base of their race. Continental imperialism was also much more hostile to political bodies than regular imperialism that sought to establish these political bodies, where if uh, in traditional imperialism, a colonial nation would want to set up political offices in those new places, whereas with the pan movements or continental imperialism, it wasn't so interested in doing that. In fact, it was hostile to the traditional elements of the state, to the political offices. And it had a lot of mob elements, because it was largely anti-state, trying to bring people together, together on the basis of their race, not in national or state affiliation, I should say. And so it had these mob elements. And there was also a kind of intellectualization behind it, where you'd have charlatan intellectuals trying to bind people on the basis of their race in order to encourage more anti-state sentiment that would you know, just bring people together after this nebulous idea of race that would obviously end poorly. Now, this ultimately contributed to a separation of the idea of nation and the idea of state, where the idea of the nation and nationalism, as it is associated with race, becomes the dominant uh, attachment uh, 
whereas the state is associated with administration, it's associated with uh, slowness, it's associated with corruption, that's bad and they have to get rid of that. Of course, there has to be a steady equilibrium for a healthy democracy to actually uh, thrive. So tribal nationalism essentially renounces the strong political, uh, its strong political institutions while appealing to mystical inner qualities like race or like nationalism. And so individuals are persuaded to believe that their very soul is, in Arendt's words, the embodiment of general national qualities at the expense of the state, getting rid of uh, a state that's viewed as being domineering and controlling. And when you have people that are atomized like this and held together through these very thin threads of things like race or nation, it makes these people desperate to find ways to justify their coming together so that it will make them ripe for belief in conspiracy theories, that there are these enemies out there that are coming to get them, which encourages them to form a stronger bond. But because that bond is founded upon nothing other than these nebulous qualities, it is only going to devour itself or become extremely violent and inflict a great deal of harm upon others. And in this case, Jewish people were seen as foreign oppressors. They were, they were seen as being that threat that was on the horizon coming for the uh, everyday people who were experiencing isolation and loneliness. And it was this tribalism as an ideology that positioned Jews and the Jewish people as enemies to already fragile communities. Now, this separation of nation and state, where on the one hand now we see an emphasis upon the nation as opposed to the state, also contributed to an idea about inclusion, where it was it was to belong to a special order, to be to belong to a special breed, to be a national, to belong to the nation. Whereas the state, you know, under the direction of the League of Nations, well, not the League of Nations, I guess that it could have had some part in this, but under the legislation of a kind of um, European order, had to give rights to everybody. No one could feel special under the state. And so they would turn to the nation and say, hey, you, my neighbor, who is uh, maybe a black person from wherever, living in Germany, uh, you are just here because of the niceness of our state, whereas I am a pure-blooded national. I, I was born here. I grew up here. I am uh, one with the race of these people. And this is what uh, I, am, I stand in for the image of this place. And this is very much what we saw with that stupid freedom convoy and just listening to people's rhetoric about it, about it it was all about realizing and satisfying the true canadian identity at the expense of parliament at the expense of the government it was you know you'd listen to people say these are true canadians going out and doing this we must stand in for these true canadians because they stand in for us even though the majority was not in support of this even though most people didn't didn't agree with that, and even though it was founded upon very nebulous qualities and it was very directionless, it nevertheless communicated to the people what they understood in their subconscious, this idea that they associate with one another on the basis of these ideas about race, ideas about uh, nationality, which is, stands different from the state that is giving out you know asylum to uh, unsavory people in its eyes or, or anything else like that. And so the state was subordinated to nationalism and subordinated to mob rule in a lot of cases, where tribalism and racism, the, what they ultimately do is separate people and make people irresponsible for the actions of others. Now, at the time, it would, have, it would be totally wrong to say that these people were just like reactionaries or political conservatives or anything like that. Because in fact, many of them were progressive. Many of them were opposed to capitalist exploitation. Many of them believed in equality and freedom and everything like that. But still, the anti-Semitism, still the race elements seeped into it. Now, the pan movement's focus on Jewish people was an example of projection because they used the idea of Jewish rootlessness to justify their own 
rootlessness, the idea that, or the fact that they were moving beyond their own nation to other nations to try to extend their tentacles into them, while at the same time they were developing propaganda that Jewish people had these like tentacles extending over the earth and trying to encapsulate the earth and code it. So in a sense, anti-Semitism at this point was kind of motivated by jealousy because these people, you know, part of this mob rule, part of these pan movements, wanted to do exactly what they believed the Jewish people were doing, even though they weren't doing that, obviously. But they wanted to do that nevertheless. And this really speaks to another element about conspiracy theories is that conspiracy theorists often describe people, uh, the conspirators, as doing things that they themselves are doing. So like with the satanic panic in the 80s and 90s in the United States, what you saw was the Catholic Church saying that, oh, well, uh, Satanists are pedophiles or Satanists are, you know, working together to uh, take over the government, when in fact it was the Catholic Church doing those things. They, they were the pedophiles and they were uh, reaching their tentacles into the secular domain of, of the government. You know, it's all just projection to distract from one's own uh, evil, essentially. Now, the pan movements also responded, as I think it's already, you know, as I've already said, in response to certain legislative moves by the state that encouraged them to oppose the state. Now, th what was happening, especially in places like Austria and Russia, was that the state was uh, assuming more power than it had historically. And so through its, through its bureaucratic functions, was actually starting to rule more by decree than by popular opinion. And because it was ruling by decree, it appeared more, um, it appeared to be kind of arbitrary, more, more heartless and cold. And so people didn't like it. And it also worked more uh, secretively. It worked clandestinely, more so than in the past. And so it extinguished people's spirits and faith in those institutions. And hence, you know, Kafka and how Kafka mused on these the emerging bureaucratic institutions and what they meant for people just going through their daily lives. Now, what else is interesting about these pan movements was the emphasis on the term movements. They didn't want to be associated with parties because parties were too close to home, too close to the old way of doing things. Whereas movements implied a kind of radical departure from these old forms and the introduction of a progressive form of thought that wasn't going to settle on anything uh, specific. And this was essentially just the roadmap for what would become, you know, ultimately extreme rootlessness and people just wanting to uh, and contributing to the culture of expanding for expansion's sake, you know, just movement for the sake of movement. Who cares who's affected? Everything's just going to mutate always for the sake of mutating. We're never going to let anything stay still. Uh, Everything is always going to be fluid, which worked very well, as we will see for Nazi Germany or Stalin, Stalinist Russia that prided itself or that very much sought to be uh, secretive and to always be shifting the power around, you know, never having it settle down in one place because then it would be too easy to identify. Now, she says that the formation of this kind of uh, lack of faith, or the crystallization of this lack of faith in response to the government was partly born out of party politics, where you'd have representational governments, where you could have, um, in the case of some countries, like even today in like France, where, uh, or even like Canada, that doesn't have a two-party system, but instead has a representative system, you could potentially have like fascists gain political power just because a few people voted for them. Whereas in other uh, other forms of doing politics or elections, you need to have accrued a certain mass of the public to actually have political power. Now, she speculates that we didn't see the same kind of mob movements in Great Britain because of their insistence upon the two-party system that gave a sense of stability and uh, uniformity and consistency that could put the people at ease. Whereas with these other government systems, where uh, these elect electoral systems, what could happen is that completely radical parties could suddenly take over, and that could like throw everything, uh, throw everything out of line. 
So she says that in the British system, people were forced to work together to work with your political counterpart because, you know, ultimately what's going to happen is the the only other person that can win is is you if you're the loser in a political party. And so you still want to remain in the good graces of the people so that maybe at the next election cycle you could win. So you don't want to just pursue uh, any wacky alternatives to whatever is going on now. Whereas in a multi-party system, there's not that promise you're going to get elected again. So you can be as radical as you want. Now, as I've already said, the mob movements, the mob movements, and the pan movements didn't like the state because it was too rigid and wanted an entirely new thing. And the Nazis and Hitler's Nazi party very much said the same thing. They were going to uh, completely overhaul the system. But as soon as they took power, they just replaced the people with their people. Very much like Trump when he's like, we're going to drain the swamp when he just executed more government spending and just filled up all the swamp with his own swamp people. And yeah, it's just, they're just, it's all just smoke. Like there's nothing substantial behind what, what they're saying. Now they also vilified classes and the idea of class here as uh, as a Marxist construction, like class doesn't exist. Citing nation as the only true factor into what can identify people or what can bring people together. They too believed that the idea of class was too rigid because it's going to clump people based on their uh, what they're earning as opposed to uh, making people acknowledge that really the only thing that matters is their national heritage. So they actually have a lot in common with the rich people exploiting them because of their mutually belonging to uh, the nation that they're in. Like how the extremely poor people in the United States could have anything, could see themselves in Donald Trump. You know, they, he could be their person. They, they could be friends. He, They could be like him when in fact he is just living off of their suffering. Can't believe you're making fun of Donald Trump so much. I can't believe you're so political. Why do you have to say that? So, of course, at the time, dictatorships and anti-party slash anti-state, maybe anti-establishment, as we might understand it now, uh, was growing in Europe long before Hitler, long before we were seeing these movements emerge. And so there's no surprise that the Nazis gained a lot of support from politicians all over, all over you know Europe. Uh, Hitler was not an aberration. There were dictatorships in all across Europe. Now, it, we're going to get into this more when we get into the section on totalitarianism, but Arendt is very clear that totalitarianism is fundamentally different from fascism, from tyranny, from dictatorships. It's totally different. So it's just important to keep that uh, on the back burner. Now, leading up to Hitler's political victory, there were three primary candidates. There was uh, the Nazis, or there's Hitler for the Nazis. There was Thalmann for the communists. Uh, who was essentially, um, yeah, anyways. And then there was Hindenburg, who stood in for everyone else in the status quo. So you had the Nazis, you had the communists, and then you had the moderate guy, uh, Hindenburg. So Hitler, Thalmann, and, and Hindenburg. Now, the political propaganda delivered nothing of substance at this time. All that we saw was uh, Hitler saying that uh, the status quo guy is only going to keep things being the same and that's going to suck for everyone or the communist guy essentially saying the exact same thing and then you had the status quo guy being like these two other people are wacky that's it there was nothing of real like substance offered and so it all came down to essentially brazen ad hominem attacks of character and what people actually were hoping to accomplish underneath what they were telling the general public and then she concludes this chapter by saying that these destructive movements remain strong even after World War II. You know, we'd see them go on for quite a while. And, you know, we saw many atrocities happen even after World War II. And that puts us here into chapter nine, the decline of the nation state and the end of the rights of man. So following World War I, there was significant poverty, migration, and instability in, uh, in Europe and across the world. People were suspicious of and, and hated one another. So while everyone was suffering, people without national uh, representation were the hardest hit because they didn't have anyone looking out for them. So everyone, everyone was suffering. But if you didn't have a state that was behind you and would defend you, 
and would promise you the rights of liberty, of freedom, of, of equality. If you didn't have a state doing that for you, you were on your own and you were going to get screwed by everybody else. So these migrants without nations, be they refugees, be they Jewish people without uh, na a nation of their own, and anyone like that, they were viewed as being parasitical and a sign of the failures of all the like appeals to human rights by the holier-than-thou governments. So these governments were like, everybody is equal. But then everyday people who viewed themselves as everyday people in the eye of the state saw these other uh, migrants coming through who didn't seem to care for the law, didn't seem to have any representation. And this put um, a wedge in between them and the idea of true uh, inalienable human rights. So to offer some degree of protection for these migrants or, or refugees, anyone who didn't have national representation, uh, the League of Nations put forward the minority treaties that would provide some legislative protection for people without a state of their own to protect them. But what these minority treaties tacitly confirmed was that nationals were the privileged group at the time. So this demonstrates that uh, the nations eclipsing the state and was a lead up to Hitler's insistence on the German people and a national identity. But of course, these minority treaties were largely just smoke. Like obviously the effort behind them was, was good and warranted, but they didn't do enough. They didn't promise that people would have uh, the right to residence or the right to work. So, you know, these governments or these business owners, whatever, in any nation that saw itself being uh, assailed by incoming migrants who weren't nationals, they could then turn these people away and they would have no one to protect them. And then if things weren't already bad enough, shortly after that, or like after World War I, uh, many companies adopted legislation that would allow them to denationalize certain citizens if they believe them to be um, anathema to, to stand against the values of the nation. And there were millions of these people and they would just be ostracized. And then they would have to go take up residence somewhere else in, in which place they would again be ostracized. So the arrival of hundreds of thousands of migrants produced a crisis in asylum capacities uh, and a crisis in, their, in how they were being used. And it caused frustration because suddenly there, was, uh, there were new cultures around, people who, who were so race-focused and associated that race with a culture, with a nation. Anything else was seen as being an attack against them which is how racism really, uh, it, it really um, foments rage and hatred of different people. Now, among the Jewish people who were selected here and targeted, Armenians as well were, um, were targeted, along with you know, Roma people and um, homosexuals as well. And in the face of a system that has completely excluded you, these people were forced often to resort to illegal acts like thievery, um, in order to earn enough to survive, in order to provide for themselves and maybe their families so that they wouldn't die, which only contributed to more stringent efforts to ostracize these people. So the police would step in and then they would ship them to another country or they would just uh, put them in jail or, or anything like that. And it would just contribute to this culture of hatred and resentment which also motivated a desire to have a place for these people that wasn't just another nation, because then the belief was that they'll just come back, which set up the stage for the first internment camps and concentration camps as a kind of new state for these people to go to. And interestingly, in, in terms of criminality and, and illegality, some of these people were actually forced or felt like if they'd committed crimes, they would be seen as a citizen because they would have to be processed judicially and would have to then attain some of the rights of what it meant to be a civilian, like going to prison, and they would have to be cared for in some way. But of course that, you know, that didn't actually do that thing. It would only contribute to this culture of hatred. But in any case, they still felt like that was a possibility. And it was at this time too that the police as an institution became really an autonomous and powerful force in enforcing a racial order 
in order to establish the ethnostate or these ethnostates that associate a net, associated a national identity with uh, with a race. So it could then prosecute those that didn't fit that mold. And this was happening all over Europe. So there was really no surprise when the, the Nazis and the SS were rolling up into various countries that they didn't meet all that much resistance. They were, you know, they, of course they did, but it's just surprising how little that was given the circumstances. And that's because Arendt says like they recognize something in them. All of these other nations kind of had the same desire motivated by their uh, anti-Semitism and their race thinking, their own imperialist views. They wanted some of that for themselves. Now, in the face of all this, the allocation of Israel to the Jewish people resolved the issue of Jewish statelessness uh, after World War II, but it also intensified a new kind of statelessness with the Palestinian people, which is important to keep uh, on the back burner and the continued violence inflicted against those people who had their land taken from them, which is can't, can't be ignored. Now, to return to the question of human rights that were founded on belief of human sovereignty, we are confronted with an issue. How can human rights be estimated or established, I should say, and enforced if everyone is a contributor to the rights and has their own needs? Who, who will get left out of this? Like if everyone has their own rights and has their own needs, how do we actually figure out how to legislate this? Who, who gets left out? And the answer is that People who are seen as being racially inferior or subhuman are the ones who get left out. So human rights, uh, but at the time, of course, human rights are still kind of nebulous quality or a nebulous category, didn't really know what they stood in for. And so they weren't really followed or enforced with tangi tangible protections like, uh, like for having housing, for example. And the difficulty of actually establishing these human rights only gets exacerbated when at the time, they were being associated with a kind of human nature, like what all humans strive for naturally, which was ironic because these human rights are also emerging at a time when humans have removed themselves from nature, at least in their own minds, they have moved themselves from nature. So it seems strange that they would also try to appeal to nature, but ultimately it was just a way to, uh, it was a convenient way to cherry pick certain elements that would just benefit them, certain ideas that would benefit them. So they can exploit nations while also saying they are fighting for equality. Of course, the, the caveat is that it's only equality for certain people. So the fact that so many stateless people didn't have rights reveals that they aren't, these rights aren't universal and natural. Now, the fact that there were so many stateless people reveals really the extent to which the world at that time was completely globalized. Like every part of it was owned and controlled and mapped and understood where these people couldn't just go to like a new territory that was yet unpopulated. They didn't have that, that ability. Everything was boarded off. So they were just forced to kind of oscillate between, um, between different mapped states that didn't want them. There was no, there was nowhere to go. They couldn't leave the planet, which only contributed to the situation. So when human rights are deployed nebulously without any clear guidance, they risk facing differences while at the same time rendering some people subhuman to justify denying them rights. So like in the case of black people in the United States who were living in the land of freedom and equality, but for some reason that didn't extend to them. And Arendt says that this is partly embedded in the very logic of human rights as it is deployed in this way, because it just reduces people to the status of humans. It completely dissociates it from their, their own history, it dissociates it from their own identities, and just tries to get rid of all the different categories of, hum of humankind, and to just subsume it under a single category of the human one that is scientifically understood, which of course opens the door for these racial considerations that can then be used to oppress certain groups while exalting others. And yeah, that'll put us here into part three, the final part titled totalitarianism, which I still don't know yet if it's going to be two parts or one part. I got to see how it goes. Uh, yeah. If you like what I did, like, share, subscribe. If there's anything I excluded, I'd love to hear about it. Anything I got wrong, I'd love to hear about it. And yeah, Catch you next time. Take care.